We now ha I have the opportunity to introduce to you one of the co-chairs, someone involved in John Adams project, Jeff Robinson. You know, it's in your program, but I think it's worth saying that Clarence Gideon got a second trial. And at his second trial, his lawyer did the things that we do every day. He went to the crime scene. He interviewed witnesses. He impeached police officers with prior inconsistent statements. And Clarence Gideon was acquitted in his second trial because lawyers make a difference. And so September 11th, 2001, our world changed. And I think everybody in the room can probably remember where you were or what you were doing when it happened. And we as a country had a response. We captured people. We detained them. We sent them to rendition. Words like black sites became part of the common nomenclature. And we took tactics from administrations in Jordan, Saudi Arabia, from the Spanish Inquisition, from Pol Pot, because we were scared and somebody had to pay. And so, five men were charged with carrying out and executing the 9-11 conspiracy. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, Walid bin Atash, Ramzi bin al Shib. Ali Abdul Aziz Ali, and Mustafa al Hazawi. They were charged with almost three counts of, or 3,000 counts of capital murder, and the government intended to execute them as quickly as possible. So I graduated from law school in 1981, and Josh Stratel was one of my classmates. Josh was, uh, distinguished himself because he had an album collection for you people that are young, those are things about this big, and you put them on a turntable, and they had music. And his album collection was not only 800 albums, but it was alphabetized by category of music. And so I got a call from Josh Dreytel in 2008 saying, will you do me a favor? And this is a warning to people when a friend calls you and says, will you do me a favor? Of course I said yes. And tonight, I told Josh, I want to say, at the same time, forget you. And actually, the first word is different than forget. But the second word is thank you for the best privilege that I have had in my entire legal career. And that was being part of the John Adams Project. Lawyers who were uh, a joint project by the NACDL and the ACLU to go to Guantanamo Bay and provide defense for five indigent people who were probably the five most hated people in the United States of America. And I want to give you just a couple of vignettes to understand you know, Rick Kamen is here, and he spoke at the CLE. I don't know if Rick is here tonight, but if he is not an official member of the John Adams Project, he is an ex-officio member, and he wears a golden kangaroo pin on his lapel for a kangaroo court. And when we went down to Guantanamo Bay, remember this was the second military commission. The first one was held unconstitutional, and this was the second one. And in the, one of the first hearings we had, the judge decided that he was going to inquire of all five defendants uh, to determine if they were competent, to determine if they wanted to waive counsel in a capital murder case, to determine if they understood what waiving counsel in a capital murder case would mean, and to determine if they were ready to represent themselves in a capital murder case that represented what the federal government called the most extensive criminal investigation in the history of the country. How long do you think it took 
for the military judge to inquire of each defendant through interpreters to make this determination. 12 minutes a defendant. In exactly one hour, all counsel had been waived and the government was telling the court, this is June of 2008, we want a trial on September 15, 2008, because they wanted executions before the November elections. One of the things that I think that happened for me at least as I went through this, uh, this experience, um, I started to collect and look at things that were written in the newspapers. And so I wanted to share with you two things, two more things that happened in the military commission. One of the defendants, Ramsey Ben Al Sheeb, stood up and said, uh, and, and let me say this, uh, I'm looking at Nina Ginsburg or looking for her and saying everything I'm saying tonight is public source information. There is no confidential or uh, other information there. So thank you, Nina, and I'm protecting myself. I haven't said anything wrong. Ramsey Ben Al Sheeb stood up and said, I'm representing myself. I'd like the discovery. And the judge said, Well, you don't have a security clearance, so you can't see it. And Mr. Ben Al Sheeb looked around the courtroom and he said, You have me here at Guantanamo Bay. You're going to kill me and bury me here. Why don't you give me the discovery? It's safer than if, if it was with the CIA. One defendant stood up and said, you know, I'd like to file motions, but I don't have a pen and a paper to write the motion. And I swear to God, the judge said, file a motion to get pen and paper so you can file a motion. If I had any doubt, it was at this point that I knew that we were down the rabbit hole and whatever we were doing had nothing to do with justice. This is part of an editorial that was written in one of the newspapers where a writer said this, the Constitution does not have a footnote that says, note to our descendants. This Constitution is intended for easy times only. At the first sign of trouble, feed this document to your dog. We won't mind, we only fought a war for it. And so, one of the best privileges of my entire legal career has been to be a part of the John Adams Project. The military lawyers that were assigned to represent these five individuals were some of the most courageous and brilliant lawyers I have ever had the privilege to work with. And there is no way to acknowledge everyone that was a critical part of this project. But the names I'm going to throw out tonight, starting with my friend Joshua Dreytel, Nancy Hollander, Nina Ginsburg, Rick Kamen, Amanda Lee, Tom Durkin, Ed McMahon, Scott McKay, David Nevin, and Jay Cannell are people that are working as hard as they can because what's happening in Guantanamo Bay now is about us. Not so much about the five men who are charged because we claim to be somebody in this world. We claim to be a country that respects certain ideals in this world. And what the NACDL and the ACLU has done in the John Adams Project is to stand up for what we really claim to be. And I will tell you this, it's not the first time. Members of the NACDL showed up at Wounded Knee. Members of the NACDL showed up in Chicago when a brother was bound and gagged and they had chained him to a chair and NACDL members came to Chicago just to sing. And then the Innocent Project came, training defenders and lawyers all over this country and freeing innocent people who were facing death and who had done nothing 
except probably be poor and minority to get convicted and sentenced to death. This is what the NACDL is about. And what I say to you is, we have honored a lot of people tonight, and you will see people that maybe you admire and you think, man, they've done this great thing. And what I have to say to you is, that's not true. Everybody in the John Adams Project, everybody had, that has represented the great tradition of this organization, they are no different than anybody sitting in this office, in this, in this, in this room. They are lawyers who cared and lawyers who were willing to stand up for what they believed was right. That's what this organization is about. And I would like to introduce to you now the executive director of this organization and a key person who put together the John Adams Project, and that's our executive director, Norm Reimer. Thank you very much. I am so grateful for that and so honored to follow Jeff Robinson to this podium. Jeff is one of the heroes of one of the greatest chapters in the history of the legal profession in America. Jeff and Josh Dreitel, who paved the way for the John Adams Project, along with Nancy Hollander, Nina Ginsburg, and all those other lawyers who were mentioned, took on one of the most difficult representations imaginable. Let me put this into some context. This nation's true commitment to liberty has been tested in generation after generation since the nation was founded. And so, as many of us have struggled to realize the promise of liberty, it has often been left to criminal defense lawyers to wage the battle on the front lines. Whether it was the Alien and Sedition Acts, the Palmer Raids, the Japanese internment camps, the Red Scare and McCarthyism, or the War on Terror, the government's weapon of choice is detention and prosecution. And whether or not liberty will survive inevitably, inevitably depends upon lawyers willing to challenge the government's use of the most awesome power at its disposal, short of warfare. And not just any old garden variety lawyers, criminal defense lawyers. The lawyers in this organization have always been there to stand with the accused, as Jeff said. But in the days after 9-11, a new and alien weapon was wielded. The wholesale use of military commissions an alternate reality in which the most fundamental rules were suspended. Clients were inaccessible. Communication was difficult or impossible or even, as Jeff hinted, even potentially indictable. When the previous administration brought capital charges against the five accused 9-11 co-conspirators under circumstances that were a sham, a process that would seem laughable to most Americans if it were used by another country, it was not at all clear that the process could be stopped. In fact, there were some who suggested that non-participation in the process might be preferable. But there were others who knew, who understood, that when government abuses power in a prosecution, it is critical that defense lawyers interpose themselves. We all know that from everyday practice. We know it from the unjust prosecutions during the heyday of Jim Crow. We know it from the McCarthy era. And as Jeff said, we certainly know it in this association uh, from Wounded Knee. But there was a problem. The distance and impediments made it virtually impossible to represent the 9-11 defendants without resources. So leaders of this organization who knew what had to be done turned to the leader of an organization that had long been associated with protecting civil liberty. And the rest is history. Anthony Romero immediately grasped the dimension of the problem, and he knew what was needed. 
He knew that tough, seasoned capital defenders had to be on the ground at Gitmo. He knew that we could not afford to walk away or boycott. We had to fight. We had to fight with everything we could muster. And he knew something else. He knew that it would take dedicated and talented criminal defense lawyers. That we had. But he also knew that it would take resources. And let me be crystally clear. Resources is his polite word for money. Neither this foundation nor NACDL had what it would take. But Anthony was not going to let that stand in the way of getting defense lawyers on the ground. I saw him beg and plead and conjole. I saw him go face to face with some of his organization's important funders and tell them they couldn't afford to say no. That history would never forgive us if we failed to fight. I can still recall those late night calls or the early morning calls from Anthony. Hey boss, hey boss, I need you to put together a proposal for me. You have to help me make the case. Or Norman, it's Anthony. You've got to come to this meeting with so-and-so. You've got to tell them what you guys can do to stop this injustice. They have to know that if criminal defense lawyers are not there to fight at every step, they will destroy our Constitution. I have never encountered anyone so dogged about fighting an injustice. I have never met anyone who was not a defense lawyer so keenly understand the role of the defense lawyer in confronting government abuse and injustice. This, more than anything, is why Anthony Romero has earned the award that we give him tonight. He has committed the ACLU to reforming the criminal justice system writ large, and the Adams Project was at the heart of that commitment. These were conceivably the most unpopular accused in America's history, but Anthony was willing to invest his organization's treasure to finance the cost of a qualified, vigorous defense. I know what it is to be an executive director and have to worry about budget issues and paying bills and supporting members and supporting your board and all the details that are so vital to any organization. I know that it's sometimes not easy to stay focused on the mission. So I have come to view Anthony as a kindred spirit because no matter what the administrative challenges were, he never lost sight of the mission. He never flinched in his passion for the cause. He saw the challenge and he rose to meet it. Those defendants were going to have first-rate lawyers, period, end of story, and they did have lawyers. And the freight train was derailed. Sadly, the full promise of the new administration did not come to be. Gitmo continues. The, stra the travesty, the stain on our national reputation deepens and darkens. But a new law was passed, and this time at least it provided that the accused would have qualified capital counsel. So the injustice to spectacle, the sorry spectacle continues, but thanks to Jeff and his fellow heroes and a man named Anthony Romero, if these prosecutions do really go forward, defense lawyers will be there. They will eventually preserve liberty for all of us. I want to close with a little personal perspective. As a defense lawyer, there is nothing that means more than the respect that you earn from a client or a client's family or the community from which they come. It's what we live for. I doubt that there are very many criminal defense lawyers in this country who have not at some point in their lives been influenced in some way by Harper Lee's classic novel, To Kill a Mockingbird. So much of that novel captures the lonely but noble path that defense lawyers must walk almost every day. But for me, I always relate most to the path that Atticus walked after he fought the fight and the jury returned the inevitable verdict. With head held high, he walked proudly and deliberately through the courtroom. And as he did so, the community, the whole community that was consigned to the balconies rose, all around they rose. And Reverend Sykes said to Atticus' daughter, Miss Jean Louise, stand up, your father's passing. Stand up, your father's passing. That is Harper Lee's metaphor for the respect that is due to those who have the guts to stare into the face of injustice without blinking. It is the respect that is due 
to a champion of justice. And so, as I invite Anthony Romero and Jeff Robinson to please join me at this time, as I invite Anthony to this podium to accept this award, I invite our community, the criminal defense community, to please stand up and show respect for a champion of justice. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now it's, it's, it's not very polite when one of my fellow executive directors almost brings me to tears at a podium. Uh, it's grounds for dismissal at the ACLU of the executive director cries in public. And, uh, but I want to say to Norman that I'm uh, incredibly touched uh, by your remarks and by your invitation to ask me to join you here tonight. I, I actually do have a prepared speech. Um, I take my remarks always at an event rather seriously. I'd be glad to send it to any of you who have insomnia. Uh, it'll be the sure cure for it. Uh, but I thought I would deviate from my remarks tonight because I've been moved by the people I've met and moved by the people I've heard. I am stunned at the strength and depth of this organization. I was fortunate enough to get to know many of your members through the work of the John Adams Project. Uh, my first connection to the NACDL was, in fact, through Josh Straytel. That's a dear friend, a good man. And it was our continued conversations. I first met Josh at Guantanamo in 2004. Four, I think, Josh, right? Uh, where I was observing his vigorous defense of his then client in the first round of the military commissions, and we struck up a rapport. And then when we realized that they were going to proceed with the military commissions with these most uh, detested of defendants, I called Josh and said, isn't there anything we ought to do? And he said, we have a great new guy at the NACDL, Norman Reamer. We can work with him. And let me introduce the two of you. We spoke by phone. And then, since then, it's been a, it's been a romance, Norman. I haven't, I've only met your wife once, but if she doesn't show up soon, I'm going to ask you to marry me, because <laughs> I'm really quite, really quite fond of you. Just have to put it out there. You have to ask what you want. He's got a very good suit on. Have you noticed how good it looks on Norman? Isn't it great to be in San Francisco? The gay guys were such in control over here. And from that, I met some of the other great uh, members of your bar. I met Nancy Hollander. I met Nina Ginsburg. I met Jeff Robinson and Amanda Lee. I met uh, David Nevin and Scott McKay. Uh, I spent lots of time with uh, Tom Durkin and Ed McMahon. And these are all of your folk, right? Who I got to get, gain the great respect of the NACDL by seeing your work. And it, it was quite curious, when we began to think through, Josh will remember, when we began to think through how we might actually jump in to the actual criminal defense cases of the high-value detainees at Guantanamo, there was enormous resistance in my own organization. This is not what we do. We do very good litigation on the systemic issues. Scott Crichton, the head of our Montana office, has done great work on the indigent defense issue. We have brought some of the high impact cases over the years that talked about some of the seminal cases in criminal justice. So criminal justice is not new to the ACLU. You go back to the Scottsboro Boys. You go back to Gideon. You go back to Miranda, Loving versus Virginia was a criminal statute. You had, uh, ba um, no, it wasn't a criminal statute, it was civil, or I'm looking at Norma, was it criminal, yeah. Yeah, she had to ride in the trunk, of course. Um, Bowers versus Hartwick, criminal case. Um, 
Some of the work that we ended up doing over the years, of course, touched on Fourth Amendment, Fifth Amendment, Sixth Amendment issues. But when I broached the subject of actually retaining criminal defense lawyers on our dime to work with the NACDL in defending the high-value detainees, I had an almost an uprising with my staff. And it was one of those moments where, luckily, when your gut is in place, you just learn to override the great resistance. I later on understood that civil lawyers and criminal defense lawyers don't get on that well. And I, and I understand now that the reason why civil lawyers are um, perhaps a bit resistant from working with criminal lawyers is because civil lawyers really aren't lawyers, you know? And it's just, give me a criminal defense lawyer any day. You know, it's just these civil lawyers, oh, we're not sure we should file this case. Oh, we have to think about the jurisdiction. Oh, come on. A good criminal defense lawyer just jumps in. You work with what you got. And we jumped in. We tried to raise money. And this will be a build up to what I'm going to ask you to do at the end, because I will ask you for a favor. We tried, we tried to raise money. And we struck out everywhere. We went to the heads of the Soros Foundation and the Ford Foundation. We went to the Rockefeller Foundation. We went to the billionaires of this city, of New York. There was not one American dollar that flowed into the John Adams Project. Not one. The only grant that Norman and I secured was from a Swiss banker who made his grants out of London because he thought this was a travesty beyond an American travesty. There was not one of the great liberal billionaires or big buck foundations who thought the John Adams Project was worth their time. And so some of the great heroes that I have to pay thanks to, including someone who's in the audience, who's one of my executive committee and foundation board members, we pulled $5 million out of, our, out of our reserves. We took the one million we got from Switzerland, we pulled another five, we spent six, all total, between the NACDL and the ACLU, because we thought it was just too important. What we watched, um, and I've since traveled to Guantanamo about seven, eight different trips, I've probably clocked much fewer hours than people like Josh or Nancy, but I've about a month of my time at Guantanamo where I sit and watch the court proceedings it is nothing short of an American tragedy. Uh, you hear full paragraphs in Arabic and you hear fragmented translations in English. You hear lawyers who are not able to have full access to their clients because of the way in which they're detained. You hear of the uh, thousands of U.S. government hours that has been spent to amass the prosecutions, and you see one JAG lawyer in one learned can, one learned hand, against a phalanx of Defense Department, CIA, FBI, uh, Department of Justice lawyers who are there, keen to uh, to get their prosecution and get their execution. It is a problem that has modestly improved in the Obama years, but it still falls very far short of, uh, of the type of justice system that we demand as Americans. And so I, I come to you with great um, humility about this work. I am not a criminal defense lawyer. I am someone who didn't know much about the criminal law context. I studied it in law school. I was thinking as I was scrapping my remarks and then saying what I would actually say to you from my heart, why I think I have an affinity for uh, the work you do. And it really has to go to my upbringing. I was born in a very Catholic family from two very devout Puerto Rican immigrants who didn't speak English. We, we, we went to church all the time. The church was everything to my mom and my dad. Uh, I was an altar boy. I taught catechism. I went to St. John Vianney, uh, public uh, pri uh, Catholic school in the Bronx. 
when I was a little boy, I would collect money on the subways and I would uh, preach the parables in the subways and I would put the money together and throw it into the basket on Sunday when I was a little boy. I was a fundraiser even then. Um, and I remember thinking I'd be a priest when I'd grow up. Uh, my grandmother was very proud of that. And I think I learned about criminal justice issues from the Bible. And I was thinking how many different ways you think about crime and punishment in these sacred texts, whatever texts you worship or not. For me, there was a wrathful God, a, a vengeful, wrathful God who would strike down on those who dare to sin. You had the great crimes of Cain and Abel that taught morality and defined the way we think about the world and it would help you set that moral compass. You would hear about such sins that only death could resolve. The whole striking of cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And then there was a different part of those sacred texts to me about the forgiving God, the God of redemption, the God that believed every life was priceless. That in the second book that I worshiped as a boy, you learned that every one of God's creatures was worthy of love and veneration. That Christ the Lord surrounded himself with prostitutes who he would bring into his inner circle and become his major ministers. That he would convert Soldiers who would persecute the Jews and Saul would become Paul. You would learn about the parables of the prodigal son who would make mistakes and come home and be forgiven. And I have to say that those were the things that make, give me a gut for issues I don't otherwise understand. I've since understood much more about crime and punishment in America because it's become my obsession. It is our number one priority at the ACLU. We spend more on crime and punishment and criminal justice issues than any other issue. It is as it should be. With the highest incarceration rate of any nation in the world, 2.5 million prisoners, 8% of the world's population, 25% of the world's prison population, with one out of every nine African-American men between the ages of 18 and 33 in some form of relationship with the criminal justice system. It is America's greatest blight. It is our new Jim Crow. And so I think about the work with the John Adams Project, and I thought about this then because our whole goal was to implode the military commissions. That remains our goal. We are in there to make sure that these systems do not work because they are unworkable. And we're going to make sure, and some of our great NACDL lawyers remain there, like David uh, Nevin, and like Nancy Hollander and others, continue to raise the due process questions to make sure that if you're going to try to bring justice you're not going to be able to do it in these legal systems. More importantly, I think, as importantly, was the idea that if we can actually stop these five most notorious defendants in modern American history from being executed, we can actually retire the death penalty. Because... Because if we can't put to death Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, then who can we or should we put to death? No one. Absolutely no one. No one. And so I'm asking you for help because here in California, you might know there's a ballot initiative that's on for next November. Uh, Barry Sheck, I'm sure, will be glad to um, talk your uh, ear off. Uh, he's the best we've got. And we need your help. We're up against uh, very deep pockets in this city. It's again a lot like the John Adams Project. 
There are not a lot of billionaires. Um, is there one? There's one who stepped forward. We're about to get outgunned again, possibly by the prison guard union. There's a, a right-wing billionaire who's just signed uh, a petition to oppose, to support the maintenance of the three strikes are out, and we assume he will also uh, uh, support the continuance of the death penalty. So we're going to be up against the wall here in California. If we can win here, the country's largest death row, with so many of the kind of public defenders that have worked so hard to make sure that, 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 that the death penalty doesn't get imposed, and yet the clock is ticking on their great legal strategy. If we can retire it here, we hit that tipping point of death penalty elsewhere in the country. And the reason why to do it is because that will help set the tone for not just what else we do on the death penalty in other states, but also what we do on crime and punishment in America. We remind our nation that this is a nation where certain key values, regardless of where you derive them from, whether it's the prohibition against cruel and unusual punishment, if you're a dedicated secularist, that that is never allowed in our America, or if it's coming from a sacred text where you just believe the words, thou shalt not kill, it doesn't matter where you draw the, the source from. The source exists in all of our walks of life, regardless of how you think or believe or, or worship, if you do at all. But there are some basic principles about the sanctity of this human life, that none of us should ever be judged by the worst of our actions on our very worst day, that none of those mistakes should ever be held over our heads like the sword of Damocles, that we are a people that believe in the importance of redemption, of forgiveness, of growth, of love, of dignity, of the sanctity of every human life that is the son or daughter of another human being, a sibling of another, a neighbor of another, no matter how difficult or challenging or depraved the circumstances around that person, that person is never depraved. That person is of limitless potential and of priceless worth. And that's what you do. And there are not a lot of other people who believe this as deeply as the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. And so we need your help here in this state. We need you to stick with Norman. He's going to take you to great directions. Yours is an organization of which I am proud to know, proud to be a part of the extended family, and I am truly humbled to have been with you tonight. Thank you very, very much for this award.